Hello everyone. In this particular lecture, we are going to wrap up our studies of governmental accounting. So we worked through various chapters. First of all, kind of a macro view of governmental accounting um, in where we talk about the different types of funds, the different types of financial statements, the difference between the government-wide financial statements versus the fund financial statements, the type of accounting, um, accrual versus modified accrual. And then, of course, we had various, after we did that, we talked about budgets and budgetary accounting and encumbrance accounting. And we also talked about the various funds. We had chapters dealing with the general fund and special revenue fund, capital projects fund, debt service fund. We talked about permanent funds. We talked about proprietary funds, both enterprise and internal service. And we also talked about fiduciary funds, custodial, as well as uh, trust funds. And here we are. We are in the last chapter. And in the last chapter, basically, we're going to talk about the final report. In the past, I've shown you the city of Boca Raton's CAFR as an example. And I still refer back to that. I would suggest you uh, look at the city of Boca Raton's CAFR in the um, this, this particular um, website uh, that I um, are including all of the PowerPoint presentations in. Uh, you can also look at any local city or local county uh, and look at their CAFR. Okay, well, what gets reported in the CAFR? Once again, the CAFR is the final report called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. In the CAFR, we are going to report not only on the primary government, and in the case of the city of Boca Raton, they are the primary governments. But we are also going to report on what is known as a component unit. And we need to decide what other organizations are component units that would be re reported on as well as the primary government. Okay, so let's take a look at this decision tree that we have in front of us. A primary government is financially accountable for another organization. And once again, what this financially accountable means is we have a component unit and that component unit will be reported within the same CAFR. So a primary government would be financially accountable for another organization if, and so this first bullet point must be present, the primary government appoints a voting majority of the organization's governing board. Now, let me explain that. If the other organization has a governing board of five people, if the primary government appoints at least three of them, that would be three out of five, that is a voting majority, then we've met that criteria. So we can put a check mark there. And you know, if we take a look at the two boxes on the bottom, it is able to impose its will on the organization. Basically, that means if the primary government wants something done, it gets done by the other unit. Or, so we have to be careful with our ands and our ors. So either that box or the second box. There's a potential for the organization to provide specific benefits to or impose specific burdens on the primary government. Let me give you an example. Let's say the primary government co-signs some debt for this other organization. Co-signing of debt, that is a burden. So that would be an example of something that would be met there. So we have to go through this decision tree first to decide if we do have what's known as a component unit. Now, if we get through this decision tree and we make a decision that this other entity is a component unit and it will be reported along with the primary government on the CAFR, we need to now decide how to report. There are two ways to report component units. We have a blending and a discrete presentation. A blending, a blended presentation, and I want you to all visualize a blender. Some of you, maybe all of you, have a blender at your house. And what does a blender do? Basically, what a blender does is it takes a bunch of different um, substances. Let's, let's say you're going to make a fruit smoothie. What are you going to do? 
you're going to throw a whole bunch of fruits in there, whatever fruits you want in your smoothie, and you basically add some water or some sort of liquid, and what do you do? You hit the on button, and the blender then takes all of those substances, which were separate substances when you threw them in the blender, and then after the blending is done, what do you have? You have one consistent smoothie drink, okay? And that's what you wanted. So the blending is like the two organizations, that would be the component unit and the primary government, basically two becoming one. And what you're going to see is the blending, basically all of the funds of the primary government and all of the funds of the component unit, um, they would all be reported down at the government, uh, I'm sorry, the fund financial statements, all the way through to the reconciliation to the government-wide statements. All right, it's like it's like it's one organization. That's a blending versus a discrete presentation. A discrete presentation is simply when we take the component unit and we report it in its own separate column. And by the way, with a discrete presentation, we are only going to present at the government-wide financial statement only. We will not present anything at the fund level. Those are the differences. Now, unfortunately, it's not as simple as saying we can make a choice to use a blending or a discrete presentation. We can't just pick and choose. We actually got to go through another decision tree to decide whether we blend or we show it as a discrete presentation. So on this next slide, you see three different, uh, let's call them thought bubbles for the lack of a better term. So we have these three thought bubbles. If a minimum of one of these three thought bubbles, we can say, yes, this is true, and put a check mark there, guess what? You have a blending. And if all three of these thought bubbles, we can say, nope, 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 those aren't true, then guess what? You default, you have a discrete presentation. So let's take a look at thought bubble number one on the left-hand side. And this is actually three questions in one. And all three questions must be met in order to say, yes, this is true, to have a blending. Okay, question number one in the thought bubble to the left. Is the governing body of the component unit substantially the same as that of the primary government? Now let me define what this means. Substantially the same means that we have a voting majority on both um, elected boards. So as an example, if the primary government has five elected officials and the component unit also has five elected officials, and if three out of the five are the same on the primary government as well as the component unit, those three people have a voting majority. They could get together and control both boards if they really wanted to. That is an example of substantially the same, is when you have a voting majority, uh, the same, same people are a voting majority on both boards. Okay, question two in that thought bubble on the left. Is there a financial benefit slash burden relationship between the primary government and the component unit? Well, a few moments ago, I gave you an example of a financial burden, and that is when the primary government co-signs a loan for the component unit or simply pays back the debt of the component unit. That's a financial burden. And lastly, does the primary government have operational responsibility for the component unit? And this is as it says. Does the primary government actually run the day-to-day -day operations of this other organization, the component unit? Okay, second thought bubble up in the upper right. Does the component unit exist primarily to provide services to the primary government or otherwise exclusively or nearly exclusively benefit the primary government? Well, let me give you an example here. This would be if the component unit has one customer and that one customer is the primary government. If this is true, then you can check this off. Let me give you an example. Let's say the primary government actually started an organization for financing. They basically are the primary government's own little bank, literally own little bank. They go out and they finance 
loans and, and what have you. And they only work for the primary government. This is an example that would fit that criteria. And last but not least, bottom right, thought bubble number three, is the component unit's debt expected to be paid entirely or almost entirely by the primary government. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think I can add too much to that. That's in pretty much plain English as it is. So once again, if a minimum of one of these three thought bubbles are correct, and we put a check mark to it, we have a blending. If not, discrete presentation. So that is the first thing that I wanted to explain to you. Um, the next thing I wanted to explain to you is, um, well, let's go through the CAFR really quickly. Uh, the CAFR, once again, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. CAFR has three sections. The first section is the introductory section. The second section is the financial section. And the third section is called the statistical section. All right, so a CAFR includes some items. First of all, the minimum requirements, um, an MD&A, the government-wide and the fund financials, as well as RSI. That would be the minimum for the financial reporting. Okay, so what else does a CAFR have? Let's take a look. First, the introductory section. This is kind of the generic section, table of contents, leather transmittal, maybe some other documents in there, maybe the, the org chart, things like that. Thank you letters, I've seen it all. Then we have our financial section, and this is what we were in for most of the, uh, most of the semester. Uh, the first thing you're going to find in the financial section of the CAFR is the auditor's report. This is the auditor's opinion. Then we have the MD&A, the management's discussion and analysis. Then we have our financial statements, both our government-wide as well as our fund financial statements. And, of course, the notes to the financials. We're also going to have another section called RSI, Required Supplementary Information. Um, that would be information that would not necessarily flow through the financial statements, but it is an important financial report that the readers of the financial statements um, would deem appropriate to, to need to know. Um, example, budgetary comparison schedule. Right? Wouldn't you want to know budget versus actual for the general fund? I would think that would be pretty important. And then last but not least, combining statements. Um, and basically, combining statements and individual fund statements, this is basically where we are going to break out non-major funds and we're going to break them out into different columns so we can see the detail of those non-major funds. Remember, in the financial statements, the non-major funds get combined into one column at the financial statement level. So we want to break that out into further detail. And then, of course, we have our statistical section. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it is quite interesting. We basically look at demographic information, economic information, our debt information, revenue information, where we get our revenues, um, you know, who are the largest employers in the city, what is the uh, per capita income, um, what is the average age of a, of a citizen, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the statistical section. And last but not least, this is probably the most important part of this chapter. And this is when we reconcile the modified accrual fund financial statements, those would be the governmental funds, and we reconcile them to the governmental activities column on the government-wide statements. Now, once again, the government-wide statements are going to use accrual accounting. There are two required reconciliations. We are going to reconcile the equity, also known as the fund balance, at the governmental fund level, once again using modified accrual. And we're going to reconcile that to the equity also known as net position at the, at the government-wide level. So governmental fund level to government-wide level. Now, the differences between modified and accrual are basically listed here on this weight. We can see the big differences. Um, let me go through uh, most of them. First, disposing of capital assets. That's when you sell a capital asset or you simply get rid of it. Well, 
on the fund if we actually received money for the capital asset. Remember, the capital asset isn't recorded on the governmental fund. We don't do that with modified accrual accounting. So we would simply debit cash and credit something called other financing sources. But on the government-wide statements, when we use accrual accounting, we have to get rid of the asset and its accumulated depreciation and figure out the gain or loss on the sale of that fixed asset. So obviously there might be a difference between the other finance source that we're recording on the fund financials versus the gain or loss that we're going to record on the government-wide statements. The difference between the two is a reconciling item. How about depreciation? Well, on the fund, there is no depreciation. But on the government-wide statements using accrual accounting, we have an expense for the depreciation that reduces equity at the government-wide level. So we'd have to reconcile that. Capital outlays, that's where we're actually spending money to buy or construct the fixed assets. Well, at the fund level, it's an expenditure. We simply debit an expenditure and we credit cash. But at the government-wide level, using accrual accounting, we don't debit an expenditure. We actually debit a fixed asset. Big difference. The expenditure reduces equity at the fund level. But at the government-wide level, equity doesn't change. All we're doing is buying an asset. That would be a reconciling item. Next, retirement of long-term debt. Well, when we pay principal at the fund level, governmental fund level, we're recording an expenditure. But at the government-wide level, using accrual accounting, what do we do when we pay off principal? All we're doing is reducing the liability. Big difference there, right? The expenditure at the fund level reduces equity. But at the government-wide level, there's no change to equity. That would need to be reconciled. Next, accrued expenses. For governmental funds using modified accrual, we don't accrue at the end of the year. We actually record the expenditures when they're due, when we incur them, when they're due. There's no accrual for the end of the year. But on the government-wide level, using accrual accounting, which you've learned in plenty of your other classes, yeah, at the financial statement date, we have to accrue for those expenses. So we're going to have an expense which reduces equity at the government-wide level, but not at the fund level. That would obviously be a reconciling item. And last but not least, issue long-term debt. Well, at the fund level, what did we do? We debit cash and we credit other financing sources. That increases equity. But at the government-wide level, using accrual accounting, all we did was debit cash and credit note payable. That doesn't affect equity. So obviously, if think of a reconciliation like this. At the top of the reconciliation, we start with the equity of the governmental fund. On the bottom of the reconciliation, we're ending with the equity of the government-wide statements. And so in between the top of the reconciliation and the bottom, we need to show these numbers, either plus or minus. And I went through... Um, all of these items, and the accounting is different for these items that you see on the screen, and that's going to affect equity, all right, differently between the governmental funds using modified accrual and the government-wide statements, which uses accrual. Now, there are two required reconciliations. We need to reconcile equity of the fund, governmental fund, to equity of the government-wide statements. We also need to reconcile the change in equity of the governmental fund to the change in equity at the government-wide level. Now, in a for-profit world, we would call this change in equity, we would call it net income. Right? But in this class, we don't use the term net income. Right? We just simply call it the, the change in, in, in uh, fund balance or the change in, uh, in net position. So those are the big topics here in Chapter 9. Once again, I refer you back to the City of Boca Raton's CAFR. I have it listed elsewhere in your, um, in your website, your class website. And I want you to look at that again.
and I want you to take a look at the reconciliations and make sure you understand how these reconciliations work.